Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And here we are, the final episode of Epic versus Apple, just the trial at least. Who knows how many more episodes there will be as Epic and the Coalition for App Fairness continue their crusade to have laws and regulations changed to break open the iOS and other mobile ecosystems. But we all know that I'm massively in support of that effort, and I'm just a big epic shill. Wait, you didn't know that? I, I should check my notes. Hold on. Oh, yes, here it is. On Reddit, I'd avoid this YouTube channel. Every video I've seen has attempted to paint Epic as a hero. It's extremely biased reporting. Bet you didn't know that, did you? Well, in any event, if you are interested in my thoughts on Epic versus Apple, especially since way back in August of last year, please do check out one of our playlists, either an antitrust Epic, going back to that beginning, or Epic versus Apple, Just the Trial, where we have been covering this 15, now 16 days of Epic versus Apple litigation. And here we are at the real end of all things. As Addy Robertson at The Verge tweets out, final day of Epic versus Apple starts in 10 with my colleague in the courtroom. Apple seems like it's in a relatively strong place fighting sideloading, but last week ended with some tough payment questions for Tim Cook. Now, this is what Ms. Robertson has gone out with for a number of days now, saying that the sideloading, the opening up of the App Store in and of itself, seems like a loser for Epic, I tend to agree, but that there are better chances for Epic with respect to the in-app payment processing question slash the anti-steering question that we have talked about. The answer to that is yes. That's by far a stronger possibility for Epic to win. There are, however, still kind of threshold questions around whether or not they can win, and that relates to the relevant market. Rogers, the judge, asks both sides' counsels for their top two issues. Both agree it's the market definition. What is the market at issue in this case? And then what are the remedies? If you find against us your honor, what are the possibilities of things you will do? How could they hurt competition? How could they help it? What is Epic asking for? How is that a problem for Apple, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Because this is a bench trial in an antitrust context with injunctive relief requested, the court actually has a fairly broad bit of discretion for how much or how little it actually wants to use its powers on one party's behalf or the other. Before we get into that, I thought it would be useful, however, to have a little bit of a refresher. We're going to go back to the very beginning, or at least not the beginning beginning where Epic dropped the hotfix that changed all of this for everyone, but the beginning of their federal lawsuit. It's a trap in which we talked about what's at issue here. We've got two sections of the antitrust laws in the United States. Sherman Act Section 1 says among other things, with a little bit of extra lawyer words here, every contract in restraint of trade is declared to be illegal. Section two says every person who shall monopolize or attempt to monopolize shall be deemed guilty of a felony and other very bad things. If you use contracts in restraint of trade, you're in trouble. If you monopolize or attempt to monopolize, you are in trouble. Now, we saw this in Epic's original complaint. We're going way back in time to see exactly what they complained about. We had a Sherman Act number two, section two claim, unlawful monopoly of what? iOS app distribution, actually distributing apps within the iOS ecosystem. We had a complaint again under section two for the denial of an essential facility that the iOS represents something like a train track or other real bit of essential facilities for conducting commerce in the United States. This was what the judge complained about halfway through the trial as neither side really talking about. And we talked about why that is, that essential facility doctrine really isn't something that the Supreme Court has upheld to any great degree in the last hundred years or so. So Epic throws it in and then basically drops it. We then have section one complaints. We have a restraint of trade, unreasonable restraint of trade, what? On app distribution. We have back to monopoly, section two, unlawful monopoly now, not of in-app distribution, but of in-app payment processing. And then we have back to section one, unreasonable restraints of trade in that in-app payment processing. And finally, an unreasonable restraint of trade by virtue of tying in-app payment processing to the app store. You've tied two products together and you can't do that under the law. You can't take a good product that everybody likes and tie a bad product that nobody wants and say, you can't get the good product unless you buy the bad product. And that was Epic's theory. Then we have a bunch of California uh, complaints that we're not going to go into because they're largely going to follow the Sherman Antitrust Act disposition. But in case you read those and you looked at those, and you said, well, Rick, 
We've got a monopoly here, potentially. We've got restraints of trade. If you don't remember, we've talked about this, but the overall thrust of those acts has been read by the courts to mean not any restraint of trade, not any monopolization, but only those that are quote unquote unreasonable. For instance, as the Federal Trade Commission says here, in some sense, an agreement between two individuals to form a partnership restrains trade, but may not do so unreasonably and thus may be lawful under the antitrust laws. There are things that are automatically bad, like plain arrangements among competitors to fix prices, divide markets, or rig bids. We call those per se violations. Keep a pin in that. That's going to come back as we discuss these final arguments. Similarly, for monopolists, we see it's not illegal to go gain a dominant market position. As the law has been interpreted, it is not illegal for a company to have a monopoly, to charge high prices, or to try to achieve a monopoly position by what might be viewed by some as aggressive methods. The law is violated only if the company tries to maintain or acquire a monopoly through, again, unreasonable methods. And if you are unsatisfied with unreasonable as the standard by which multi-billion, if not trillion dollar companies are regulated in the United States, you are not alone. It is not a great quantitative threshold to determine whether or not your activities are legal or illegal. That's why there's so much gray area in what we've discussed. That's why when we talk about what my predictions are, I can only talk about the strength of the various cases I see here, and I cannot reach into the judge's mind and tell you what will pop out on that piece of paper because she could reason either direction and defend a win for Apple or a win for Epic on what was presented. You know, we're relatively mean here about Epic's theory of the case, Reddit comments notwithstanding, but a reasonable mind, as the judge certainly appears to have, could determine that that argument has merit Hell or high water, whatever happens to the rest of the walled gardens. Uh, And that could certainly happen in this case. I think it's unlikely, and we'll get to my thoughts a little bit more in depth at the end of this, at the end of the entire Just the Trial video series, but we cannot predict with any level of certainty what a single judge will decide on things like reasonability or unreasonability on such complex economic questions. And if you see someone out there, a journalist or otherwise, promising you that this case will go one direction or the other, I don't say this often, but that person is lying to you. Doesn't mean they couldn't potentially get it correct, like hitting the dartboard exactly correctly. But if they're predicting with certainty something coming out of this case today, then they are otherwise lying to you. Let's go into these closing discussions because I think you'll find them as interesting as I did. Arguments start with talking about the distinction between foremarket, i.e. the competition in phone sales, and aftermarket, competition for in-app purchase sales, and whether Apple has a monopoly in one or both. Now, even here, we've got a lack of granularity, a lack of distinction. Can you see it? The foremarket is phone sales. The aftermarket is in-app purchase sales. What happened to iOS? What happened to the app store and app distribution under that? We have many, many, many more markets than just selling the Apple phone and selling in-app purchases, V-Bucks, in Fortnite. There's a lot of steps here, and that's one of the things that complicates this entire conversation. But foremarket and aftermarket can very much matter because even without a foremarket monopoly, even without Apple selling all the iPhones and that's the only phone available to you, Even without that, you can still have a monopoly in an aftermarket if you properly establish that it is entirely secondary to the original purchase. And Apple has gone out there and said, hey, no, it's a holistic purchase. It's a product. People know what they're getting. They're getting an app store. They're getting an ecosystem. That's why, in part, they buy our iPhone. It's not a secondary market. Epic has said it is. They shout at each other. There's a battle of the experts. And who knows? It's going to be up to the judge at the end of the day. I think Apple has the better part of this argument, but I'm not judging this thing. Apple argues that it has lots of different device competition, while Epic is focusing on the idea that there's a platform duopoly and competition between only iOS and Android. Epic is also focusing on the aftermarket, competition within the sales of digital goods inside the iOS ecosystem, and in fact, the distribution of those goods. The judge asks Epic's Gary Bornstein, Gary Bornstein is going to be referenced a lot here, he's on the Epic side, about substitutes in the market. I think it's critical that we make clear what the product is in this market. Couldn't agree more. Apple has argued it's digital game transactions. Bornstein says it's app distribution. There is no substitute for getting the Fortnite app or other apps on iOS except for the app store, says Bornstein. He says the potential substitutes would be an alternative app store or direct sideloading. Conversely, loading the same app on Android slash console 
isn't a substitute for Fortnite access. And we talked about this at the very beginning of Epic's case and how problematic I find it in the world of antitrust because of the implications here. If you create a platform and you have an operating system, you undoubtedly have 100% of the market for access to the product that you own and control. That is a given. That is tautological. And what Epic is arguing here is Bornstein so easily uh, articulates and could have been even better if it were actually in the trial itself is that there is no substitute for what we're asking for because we've defined the market as access to your phone. And there's nothing Apple can say to say that somebody else has access to the phone. They don't. They are saying the actual competitiveness here is Fortnite elsewhere, Fortnite on Android, Fortnite on Switch, Fortnite on PC, and a lot of other applications that can do that or choose not to do that, but that they control the gatekeeping access to their phone. If Epic's theory here were to be applied to other walled gardens, there isn't a walled garden on earth that wouldn't fall. So they try to ally this by saying the four market has a duopoly, the phones are out there, but at the end of the day, they always collapse into this argument that says, nope, that market is access to your hardware and there aren't any substitutes if you control that access. If that is the theory that wins the day, yes, Apple's a monopolist and we get into the secondary questions about whether they're unreasonably doing things with that power, but there isn't a walled garden on earth that wouldn't be affected by that decision. That's really the reason why I took up this in-depth look at this case. That's what I found so fascinating. And it's still an open question as to whether the judge will rule on that side of the question. Judge to Epic's counsel, your formulation seems to ignore the reality that customers choose an ecosystem, right? There's a lot of evidence in this trial that in the four market of devices, it is Apple's business strategy to create a particular kind of ecosystem that is incredibly attractive to its purchasers. If you buy the Xbox or you buy into a variety of these particular walled off gardens, you know that that's what you're buying into and you choose to make that decision. And that's said as well as I could possibly say in virtual legality here. When we talk about walled gardens, what your options are and how Epic's theory would destroy those, it is entirely premised around this line of argumentation. People in my comments sometimes don't understand what I'm saying there. And to them, I say, that's my fault. I try to articulate my thoughts as well as I possibly can. But this is the crux of it. People go and they buy an iPhone. And yes, some of them don't buy an iPhone for wall garden, but some of them do. And Apple wants to sell that wall garden. And your theory by saying control of your system is in and of itself illegal under law would eliminate that as a business model. And Epic basically refuses to acknowledge that throughout because they know the impact that will have on a lot of legal thinkers, but definitely this judge who has pointed out that that's a potential problem from the get-go. So she articulates it right here and says, people buy it and that's what it's about. There seems to be competition and that's what I said. It's somewhat of a dynamic area right now because competition is good and people are trying to figure out ways to access those consumer choices. But your economic substitutes destroy that consumer choice. You cannot choose a walled garden if Epic wins on this theory. Epic's Bornstein says people aren't aware of what kinds of costs they're going to incur inside the App Store. If you're thinking about a $1,000 purchase of an iPhone, you are going to not be as interested in the 30% commission you might pay on a bunch of 99 cent in-app purchases. You see the alighting right there? Lawyers. Eric Bornstein here, or Epic's Bornstein, is, is good. He elides it. He says, oh, you're paying that 30% commission because he's got some hypotheticals that suggest that that, that is in fact the case. But as this judge will say later on in these final discussions, and as we've seen throughout the court trial, we don't actually know exactly how much that's passed on. In fact, Epic and their game store might have presented the best piece of evidence that you don't get savings passed on to the consumer. And as we've talked about under antitrust law, it is most concerned with that consumer experience. That's why you see it framed this way by the judge. The judge says, well, you go in and you pick a phone, you go in and you pick an Xbox, you know you're gonna be locked into that ecosystem, you're making that choice. You can't get Starfield on PlayStation, sorry gamers. And the judge is saying that's okay. Epic's Bornstein here says, no, no, you're not thinking about that at all because you're not thinking about in-app payment, you're not thinking about purchases, you're not thinking about 30% increases, you're just thinking about buying the phone. And not sure the judge is buying it. Judge says she hasn't seen evidence that people aren't making an informed choice. There's two different ecosystems that they're moving into, and they know this. Bornstein disagrees. Customers are not focused on and not terribly aware of these downstream costs. Well, judge says the cost of the games, uh, and they're getting an, on the Android versus what they're getting on the iOS, they aren't distinctly different. So from a consumer perspective, the reason they don't think about it is because it's currently all the same, which is also the secondary feature here, right? You've got... 
Epic suing Google. You've got Epic having this issue with Android that allows sideloading, that allows these open stores, and the judge kind of getting to it a little bit here. And we try to tea leaf read a little, but I always don't advise that for judges. There's a lot of devil's advocacy that happens in these kinds of communications, just like they likely happened in part with the communication with Tim Cook at the end of last week. And she says, well, wait a minute, those costs are the same. And isn't that a pretty good bit of evidence that actually having sideloaded stores, having other access points on the Android ecosystem doesn't change those game prices? Are we really talking about consumer welfare now or are we talking about competitor welfare? Because the job of the antitrust laws in the United States, at least, is not to protect competitors. It's to protect competition. We are okay with companies ruthlessly defeating their competitors and using contracts to do so as long as it doesn't negatively affect the overall consumer experience. And that comes up again and again. Bornstein says the issue is that if one platform decided to dramatically change its commission slash app pricing, there's very little reason to believe that this will cause switching. And you see Epic's main problem here that we've already talked about, which is that Apple didn't do anything last August. Epic just decided that now was the time to strike. And I'm not holding that against them in many respects, seeing the political landscape, both regulatory wise and legislative wise, you can see how Epic came to the conclusion that now was a good time to strike, that there are these governments that are already investigating the tech companies and they can kind of ride those coattails. And I get that. But Apple as a business didn't do anything. So Epic is left with these hypotheticals. There's very little reason to believe people would move because of our survey, which I think was a terrible survey. Apple's survey was terrible as well, but Epic's was probably even worse. And there's little reason to believe they're switching because of all this friction, but we don't know because Apple didn't actually do anything. Apple's Daniel Swanson disagrees with Bornstein and says the issue is moot. The evidence shows that iPhone owners all have PCs and Macs. They have laptops as well as consoles, tablets, a whole boatload of devices. This is not a case where there's one device out there. It's not an essential facility. There are substitutes across everything. It is not a market that is iOS access. You can get your product to eyeballs in different ways. Now, the judge notes to Apple, well, the 30% number has been there since the inception. And if there was real competition, that number would move. And it hasn't. And that may or may not be accurate. Although the actual assumption that it would move if there was competition clearly isn't. As you can talk about in any business or economics class, you can keep your relative commission rates even with fierce competition if you're changing other things, right? If you are Steam, you can advertise, oh, we've got forums. Oh, we've got a functional shopping cart. Oh, we do these other things that mean that you like us and you're willing to pay 30% to us instead of only 12% to Epic because they don't have those things. You can fight on quality. You can fight on brand goodwill. We've talked as part of this series about Apple essentially being a consumer luxury good that bears all the indicia of a fancy jewelry box for people that like those kinds of things. Apple has invested in that as silly as you might find it. You more analytical people that are in my comments and say, ah, that's stupid. I get that. But Apple has invested in it and that isn't stupid to everybody. And some other people like different things than you and I. But the judge continues, if the relevant market here includes developer side competition, So far, there doesn't seem to be anything that is in the market itself that is pressuring Apple to compete for developers. Swanson says the commissions now are de facto lower than they were under physical distribution. It's not a monopoly price. It's a competitive price. He notes prices didn't go up when Apple, according to one Epic witness, and Ms. Robertson is kind of eliding what is actually happening here, the major Epic witness, the main Epic witness, allegedly became a monopoly in 2010. And their main theory is that Apple was functioning as not a monopoly with these restrictions in place on App Store access, on in-app purchases with a 30% commission, and then became a monopoly because of the foremarket that then rattled down into the aftermarket, which it was always 100% owners of, and which the substitutes it's arguing for don't apply to the foremarket that made it a monopolist. You with me? No? Neither is anybody else related to this case. Don't hold it against you. It's just a problem with the definitions and hopefully the judge can sort it out. Swanson says that meanwhile, Apple has increased its device quality, as we just talked about, without raising commissions. iOS games can hold their own now with some of the best games on consoles and PCs. That is quality competition. It may not feel fair that some people pay more than others addressing Cook's testimony, but that doesn't mean there isn't competition in this market. 
Judge notes that there's another class action suit pending against Apple. Apple's not just being sued by Mr. Sweeney and his company. They're being sued by an entire class of developers, she says. And that's an interesting non sequitur. Technically speaking, that suit shouldn't matter to this one. But certainly, we're human beings. We don't do all of this in a vacuum. Epic brought this case knowing, in part, that there would be a House subcommittee report that talks about the evils of Apple, that there would be a European Union regulatory body saying they think they found some evils of Apple with respect to anti-steering, of all things, uh, and Spotify. And that's the world in which we live. But Apple's argument here that says we don't have to just compete on price. We don't have to be a dollar store in order to be successful. We can compete as a luxury good isn't wrong. And the judge knows that. There's some devil's advocacy here. She seems like a smart person that's got this down, at least as far as anybody can have it down. Epic's Bornstein comes back to whether Apple feels competition. I think the record is clear. There is nothing, literally nothing, except one document I will talk about where Apple employees ask, do we need to do something to stay competitive on price? But you can't ignore the quality issue, the judge says. Notes that Sweeney acknowledged iPhone supports many more games now. There is an enormous amount of innovation on the iPhone that is, in fact, allowing these games to be played and which game developers are benefiting from. Bornstein says, sure, they innovate on the iPhone because they want to sell more iPhones to consumers, but they don't innovate on the App Store itself. And that's not a terribly workable argument to my eye, right? Bornstein and Epic are completely focused on competition on price. And Apple hasn't moved its price in however many years. That is 100% true. They want to say now, and this really wasn't presented as part of their main arguments, that the failure to move on price, not just to fail to increase it, but to move it at all, suggests that they aren't competitive. And yet, we've seen that 30% lock-in across a whole sort of retail Uh, environments for a number of years. And we don't think that GameStop isn't trying to compete. We don't think that Steam isn't trying to compete. We just think that they have certain things that they're trying to do otherwise. Now, GameStop is going under or might uh, in the near future, but certainly Steam has been successful and there are other ways to compete, including quality. Then Bornstein says, improving the phone isn't improving the aspect for game developers, which I find to be entirely wrong. Right, if we go back to my circus tent metaphor from way back when, making the circus more valuable, putting in more elephants, having better lighting and smoother seats, getting more people in the door to see what you're otherwise hawking in those stairways, access to the circus tent is getting more eyeballs and potentially more dollars to developers. And yes, it's getting more eyeballs and dollars to the circus tent owner, to Apple. But that's why a percentage commission generally works for these kinds of relationships is you do get both sides wanting to see those profits. Or as the judge says here, what if we define the market solely as mobile gaming, not games in general? Switch, iOS, and Android. Bornstein wants to exclude the Switch because it has no cellular connection and people don't tend to carry them around with them all the time. Everyone is confused now about whether the iPad should count as a mobile gaming device. Judge settles on Android slash iOS mobile gaming as a category. Bornstein seems relatively satisfied with the idea of this as a category. And I don't know why. When we look at this, they need to have access to the iOS be the definition for their monopoly argument. Not the least of which is because they really haven't briefed any other market that's kind of side saddled with Android. If you include Android game distribution with Apple game distribution, you definitely don't have a monopoly. You might have something approaching market dominance and power in that market, but you don't have what you need, which is that you have substitutes for the access to Fortnite. You have substitutes for all these various other apps that operate in mobile. So I'm not sure why Epic would concede it at this point, other than to suggest that, yes, they would like a narrower rather than broader selection. You'll also see that Apple doesn't much care for it. Apple says that would make them very sad. And yet we still have a market that is yet to be defined. And the judge kind of plucking things out of midair as to what would make a good substitute market for these products. If you think we're not getting any closer to understanding what the judge is likely to determine on this, I don't blame you. But the arguments are pretty good. We then get a talking to about California. California being one of the most litigious, certainly one of the most legislative states in the United States is an open question because we do have those California claims. Judge and Apple Swanson now talking through the test that would be required to demonstrate anti-competitive conduct is taking place. Judge says that there's some California legal precedent that violating the spirit of antitrust laws can be a legal issue even without a strict traditional monopoly under the Sherman Act. So there's the possibility that Apple could be violating the law and have to change its behavior only in California, the judge says. 
And, you know, I skipped those California claims primarily because they are generally going to follow what's happening in the federal antitrust lawsuit, but also because I'm not a California attorney. And there's a lot of minutia that can be applied to things like specific states and especially California law. If that were to happen, all hell would break loose. And again, I've got a lot of devil's advocacy thoughts here on what the judge is doing in terms of poking holes and coming to a better understanding. But if Apple were barred from doing something significant only in California, California with as big a market as it is, that would have impacts across the country. We didn't really get separate briefings on California. We didn't get any notions of that. So it'll be interesting to see if the judge bases her opinion on California law for purposes of this case. I would tend to doubt it based on impacts, based on public interest in the proceedings. But we do have a question like this one. It is, however, short-lived. Now we're discussing the FTC versus Qualcomm case, where an appeals court reversed a win for the FTC, trying to compare whether this is a similar case. Addie Robertson, I'm not strong on this part of the law, but the court is going over the test for whether Apple had a less restrictive alternative that would have provided the results it wanted around the App Store while being less anti-competitive. There are two things here. The first is FTC Qualcomm, and it has certain amounts to do with what we're talking about. It has to do with limiting access to your licenses and your technology uh, to competitors and having to follow your rules. But in this case, the Ninth Circuit, in a unanimous opinion, reversed the district court's decision and held that the FTC, who's the plaintiff, failed to satisfy its initial burden under the rule of reason framework to prove that the challenged restraint had a substantial effect that harmed consumers in the relevant market for these specific technological chips. So a couple of things pop out there. They're talking about rule of reason, which we're going to talk about right now. And they're talking about harming consumers, not harming competitors. And this is something that Epic continues to get tripped up on. And tripped up on might be a little strong. They're doing it deliberately to try to emphasize what they see as the theory of the case. But we saw the judge actually talk about this, and we can talk about it with you, in the preliminary injunction at that level last fall. So let's look at rule of reason analysis. And this is actually describing how she was going to rule on the tying question, whether tying IAP to the app store was a problem. But it helpfully describes what's happening with the rule of reason, which is a three-part kind of burden shifting test. The rule of reason analysis is more fact specific than the per se analysis. Remember, that's price fixing and things that are automatically illegal. Here, the first element focuses on the harm to competition and consumers. Epic Games errs by focusing on harm to competitors and for that reason has not sustained its burden at this juncture. And then she footnotes it. Nevertheless, for the same reasons as described for separate demand under the per se analysis, the court can envision a plausible case for anti-competitive effect, given the serious questions as referenced above regarding Apple's IAP restrictions and whether they reduce consumer choice or increase price due to exclusionary conduct. Look at this framework. Does the IAP restriction, the prohibition on using other payment processing within an app on their phone, reduce consumer choice? It might. Consumers might want to use other payment processors, and you can make that argument. Epic might have that argument to make. Certainly, they have tried over the last 15 days, or increase price due to the exclusionary conduct. And that hasn't really been proven, at least not to my satisfaction from what I've been able to see, because so many of the prices are the same. But if it does that, that's the first step. Epic says, okay, your anti-steering rules, your app store restrictions, your in-app purchase restrictions, they do this thing. They reduce consumer choice or they increase price. We just assume it. When that happens, the rule of reason kicks in and says, well, Apple can prove it the other direction. Even if it had, Apple can offer a pro-competitive justification consistent with step two of the rule of reason analysis. They claim that IAP provides a convenient way to transact online, security and fraud protection, refunds and customer support, parental controls, a list of purchases, et cetera, et cetera. All things that we've seen roughly described in the last 15 days of testimony in this case. However, as we just saw being discussed by Ms. Robertson today in the final dispensation here, there's the third step. If Apple then says, okay, yeah, that's a pro-competitive justification. I'm trying to make my product better. I'm trying to compete with other products. Okay, Epic has one last bite at the Apple. They get the chance to demonstrate that the pro-competitive efficiencies that Apple claims could be reasonably achieved through other means, through less anti-competitive means. That the premise here is, okay, your anti-steering rule, as an example, it's anti-competitive. We can see it reduces choice, it increases price, whatever. Apple says, well, it makes sense because we're trying to keep all the, everything in line here. We're trying to run a, 
app store and keep an iPhone going. And the court says, yep, okay, that's pro business justified. And then Epic can say, well, there are other ways you could have done it. They could have gotten you to the same place, X, Y, and Z. But they have the burden to show that. And that's what's being argued about when we talk about this. Addie Robertson saying less restrictive alternative. What else could you do to get you to the same place? Now we're wrapping up relevant markets with Epic's Bornstein making final points. He's objecting to defining the market as games. Epic, of course, is not just a games company. Judge says, yes, yes, she gets it. Antitrust law looks at aggregate markets and not individual companies. Also true, Epic has been, as you can see as part of this litigation, the champion of the developer class. Yes, it's the one suing and trying to get these things changed, but it is using everything Apple has ever done to developers as backstop for its legal arguments. Addy Robertson editorializes, gets the feeling Judge Rogers is extremely done with what is a game discourse. And yes, we have talked a lot about Roblox in this series, and I'm very thankful that it didn't actually come up other than that reference in this particular argument, because what is a game doesn't matter that much. Epic points out the report about the App Store's allegedly high profit margins as he wraps up. Even though Apple says it doesn't track these numbers, the numbers are the numbers and the numbers don't lie. Judge expresses doubt about this, says Tim Sweeney admitted Epic also doesn't do itemized profits and loss. Lawyer says that Apple clearly produced charts that show numbers, even if it said they weren't totally accurate slash fair, and there's no evidence that Epic even had comparable ones. So what are we fighting about? Now we're done with market definition. So let's take a pause here, because even though we said they're only going to talk about market definition and the remedies, we aren't. We're going to have a mid-go here about how Apple conducts its business. What do you think of that market definition? That's a very important threshold question. If Epic can't win that, if Apple isn't a monopolist with dominant market power over a relevant market, then a lot of Epic's case just goes away. Even if the judge thinks X, Y, or Z is bad, it just goes away. And so that's a very, very important question. It's why they wanted to brief the judge on the final day. I don't know that Epic won that. I don't know that its monopoly case can actually survive. It will have to lean on the restraintive trade case. And that most specifically relates to the in-app payment processing. And I think, as we've talked about as part of the series, the anti-steering rule, which the judge appears to have zeroed in on. And again, we're reading minds here. I never recommend it. And the last opinion here could be entirely different from all that, but appears to have focused and zeroed in on those anti-steering restrictions. Now, Let's talk about how Apple does business. We're done with market definition and going to talk about company conduct with Apple's Veronica Moye. She is trying to counter a report the judge cited last week that showed 39% of App Store developers were dissatisfied. In fact, the judge brought this out out of nowhere, pulled it out of a robe, I don't know, for the last questioning that she did of Tim Cook, which you can go check out in our prior video here. Highly recommend it. It's only about 15 minutes long, I think, where the judge actually cross-examines the CEO of one of the largest tech companies on earth. Certainly well worth your time if that's all that you want to watch out of this entire series. But now we see Apple trying to defend that, saying, okay, the 39% doesn't actually include everything that we're talking about. The record is replete with examples of responsiveness to developer feedback at Apple. Apple's Moya is now going through all the commission reductions that Apple has made since the App Store launched, the video partner program, the small business program, and says, even if the small business program was introduced because of litigation, it's still pro-competitive. You know, lawyers, we'll say anything, right, to try to get to the end goal uh, here. I don't recommend this particular argument. As the judge says, does that mean we have to wait for people to sue Apple? How can you reasonably say that should be a competitive driver? And the answer is you can't. Sometimes you reach too far. And oftentimes Apple has done that. I've tried to point it out when I think that it has happened. There have been times in the motion stage and in the litigation stage here where I think Apple has been ridiculous, either with their answers on cross-examination or what they have tried to show. This is one of them. If the small business program was launched due solely to Epic suing you, then that's evidence that Epic has that you aren't competitive and that you're responding to things like litigation pressure. Now, I don't think it was solely because Epic sued you. I think that you probably had a plan to do it for a long time, but I also don't fully buy that it's just COVID and it's just small business support, et cetera, et cetera. So you've kind of created a situation for yourself if you're Apple because the answers that you gave aren't credible. And yet the answer that Epic would put out there that it's just because of the lawsuit probably isn't credible itself. It's somewhere in the middle, like so many legal questions. Epic's Bornstein argues Apple's APIs, etc., aren't part of the App Store, and developer satisfaction surveys are skewed by people liking tools like APIs, but liking the App Store much less. 
the judge to Epic's lawyer, well, you made a reference to the lack of price decreases, but there are other factors like output and quality. We talked about those earlier. What specific direct evidence is there of anti-competitive effects? Epic's Bornstein cites higher prices and lower innovation, specifically in the market for app distribution and in-app payment options, as opposed to phone tech, et cetera. And here we again get the overall theory and difference between the parties writ large. Apple says holistic device, single market, not aftermarket. This is what people buy. It's all one thing. It's a product we sell. Epic says, sure, they innovate on things like metal and they develop a bunch of APIs and they're constantly making new phones and having conferences. But what have they changed in the app store lately? And that should be what you decide on. And I don't think that's in fact what you should decide on. Obviously, I've made my opinion clear on that point that Apple is in fact doing something to earn its money and that something relates to getting people to buy iPhones and part and parcel of that is APIs and research and development for what the iPhone is. And the judge ultimately comes to a similar conclusion, at least in her questioning. Apple's Moye disagrees with Epic about Apple's developer tools not being a part of the store. These tools are provided to developers so they can have apps on the store, and Apple invests many resources into building them. Moye reiterates that consumers specifically buy an iOS device for Apple's longstanding brand promise of better security and safety. And if they want an alternative model, they're free to get an Android device. Moya is criticizing Epic's last minute desperate attempt to scrounge up witnesses unhappy with Apple. They were trying to bring someone in on Friday. Judge says that's not quite fair. Notes down dog and match group had testimony ready right at the beginning of the trial. Epic really didn't need extra developers to come and pound on Apple. And again, that's fair. Developers are undoubtedly unhappy with Apple, certain sets of them at least. And every developer is undoubtedly desirous of having 30% become 3%. That would be great for them. Not so great for Apple. And the question of whether the court should intervene is at the heart of all of this. Now we're talking about the anti-steering provisions, where, as I've said, I think if Epic is going to win something, it's going to be here. Comparing to the Amex case that found they were legal, Judge says Apple's hiding of alternate payment options could be anti-competitive, even under the Amex precedent. Apple's Moye says there's nothing unique or unusual about adding anti-steering rules for efficiency. Rogers jumps in. Cook said... Himself, it wasn't about efficiency. I understand Apple has a right, in my view, for its intellectual property, but that's a different reason that Cook, your CEO, did not argue that anti-steering provisions were for efficiency. And the judge is clearly going to take Tim Cook as the master witness for this kind of thing. He said it's protecting your intellectual property, which, by the way, is a justified answer, provided your approach to protecting your intellectual property is not deemed by a court like this one as unreasonable under the antitrust laws. Moye, we believe it's a legitimate business justification to not have people have links on the App Store. Judge stops her. Okay, but why not just a note saying there are more options online? Moye says it would be like having a sign at Nordstrom's telling people to buy at Macy's. Well, Judge Rogers says that if you go to a Nordstrom's, you might not see a Macy's sign, but you can see signs indicating you can pay through several methods, i.e. Visa, MasterCard, Amex. So what if App Store payment processing is more like that? Now, I would say to that judge's metaphor, you also can often see stores like a Macy's or other promote their own credit cards and get you to try to buy those with gifts and offers at the payment register. But that doesn't really change things. She's right. You can have other payment processors advertised. And here, Apple has a closer relationship to the payment processor owning it uh, than in those particular instances. You also see what I have thought for a long time now, and you can check the comments on this as well as my videos might be a solution that the judge entertains that probably wouldn't make Apple too upset. And that would be some kind of generic mandatory disclaimer as part of really every app that says something along the lines of this app has in-app purchases. You can purchase these directly through the application here on your iPhone, or there may be other avenues available to you provided by the distributor or developer please inquire with them or something along those lines where you just have it generic and it applies to all the applications and you're allowed to say, hey, you could have another place to buy, go check it out. But the developer isn't allowed to slam Apple. There's non-disparagement issues, isn't allowed to do all these various other things to advertise and move people out of that ecosystem. It's a possibility. It'll be interesting to see if she goes down that road. But again, she ultimately has to find that the anti-steering rule is unreasonable on its face which may or may not be something that happens. 
Apple's argument is basically that developers can totally email consumers with promotions, but they can't specifically send targeted emails to users who have just signed up, telling them that they can get something cheaper by going elsewhere. Epic has not raised a legal claim here, saying it has been harmed as a result of any anti-steering provisions, Moye says. In fact, no evidence anyone has. Judge notes Down Dog certainly said they were harmed. There's a little back and forth, but Judge sticks to her guns on it. That being said, Down Dog isn't the plaintiff here. And what's interesting is that you do have testimony from Tim Sweeney during his days when it really wasn't that big of an item at the start of all this, where he said, hey, I didn't offer V-Bucks on the store, on the website, because I didn't think people would be interested in buying them. That comes into play here, that that prevents there from being a lot of evidence that consumers actually want to go out and want to go get those V-Bucks on a different application than the App Store. Epic thinks that plays for them. I think there's an argument to be made it plays for Apple. Either way, the judge is probably going to talk about it in her final opinion. Judge Robert Rogers and Epic's Bornstein are talking about the circumstances under which developers can get email addresses. Bornstein complains that devs have to go through a separate step of asking for one. Rogers says that might be privacy preserving for the user. I just like this particular interaction because it really does sound like Bornstein has fully embraced the Epic mantra, right? He complains that we have to go through a separate step of asking for someone to give us their email address. Like it should just be granted to them. And the judge properly says, well, you know, when we're talking about email addresses, usually you have to ask in order to go and get that. I think that's probably a good thing. Bornstein says, if we're doing a mall analogy, it would be like if you shop at a chain store like Under Armour and that store could have signs saying it has outlets at other locations, even though stores are paying the mall to be there. Apple's Moye says, either way, there's still no evidence Epic was harmed by anti-steering rules. They're just shouting at each other now, and, and that's fine. And I do like Bornstein's uh, franchise location uh, metaphor and analogy. That could be something that winds up working. I think the judge will have to think about it a little bit further. Addie Robertson again. Moye says, also, Apple having anti-steering rules is proof it does have competition because it's trying to stop developers from referring users to those competitors. Epic's lawyer calls this economic nonsense, and... I side with Epic. Sorry, Reddit, you were right about me. But yeah, again, this is another stretch for Apple. And this is lawyers stretching. This is what they do. It's fine. Uh, But you see, we have to have anti-steering rules that proves we have competition because we're trying to prevent people from going to competitors. That leads directly into smashing competition, not competitors. It's really not what you want to argue. Epic's lawyer is correct on that. On remedies now. Judge starts with Epic's Bornstein, says it bothers her that Epic doesn't seem interested in paying for access. And if it is, it doesn't have a good explanation for how it would collect money. I still don't understand where you expect this to go. Bornstein, Apple doesn't need to give away access just as a baseline. That is not what Epic has obligated, but they should be barred from structuring their charges in a way that has anti-competitive effects. And this presents one of the main problems with Epic's theory of the case. And I think it's one that's skipped by a lot of people that are, Apple must go down, Epic must win, they're going to open everything up and break open the gates, and everything else is going to go great. That is that even if the court finds that Epic gets certain of these things, they aren't going to bar Apple from every future business model that is potentially available to them. And Apple has said in their motion documents and has shown instances where in the past they have evaluated other ways of pricing out App Store access, iPhone access, and said this 30% otherwise free with a $99 registration charge was what got the most developers the cheapest and most efficient access to these eyeballs in our ecosystem. And if we can no longer do that, we are going to have to really evaluate the business model. We're going to have to think about doing flat rates for everybody and other things, pay per download for free to play games that would be within their ambit. And that would really negatively impact a whole host of developers out there, all for the benefit of Tim Sweeney and Epic, which is why one of the things that I've talked about in this series is to note that Epic plays the self-righteous defender of developers. And I really do believe that in certain respects, Tim Sweeney believes that's what he is. But at the end of the day, it's about Epic making billions of dollars, come hell or high water. Apple can change its business model. This is the same kind of argument they made in their motions. Apple can charge differently. They just can't charge this way that hurts Epic specifically. And Apple said, well, that could absolutely cripple developers if we have to go and get our R&D back from a different method. This is what made the most sense. Now, the judges said, well, it makes Fortnite subsidizing all these other developers. And to some extent, that's right. 
But when we're fighting over business models, that's been something that the American court system has been reluctant to step into the middle of. As the judge continues, the effect of the options that Epic provides as remedies would result in paying Apple nothing. Bornstein says Apple could choose to charge business differently. They just can't charge in a way that has these anti-competitive effects. As determined by Epic and its experts after the fact and with no change in the way that Apple functions for the last decade or so presents a problem for the court system and certainly one that Epic is incapable of answering. Epic has to tell the court exactly what this should look like, how this won't harm people, and they leave it with, Apple could change something, they could charge people. Epic doesn't care if you charge a de minimis amount on a per download basis because they're making so much money. And if they can get access to not paying 30%, well, all the better for them. The goal is changes that are driven by the market rather than being driven by the monopoly, says Bornstein. And how does Apple respond? They want a compulsory license of all of Apple's intellectual property, counters Apple lawyer Richard Doran. Doran, under that model, nothing would be paid to Apple for the use of its intellectual property for the use of the platform. So this is the lawyer doubling down, right? We know the judge has a concern that Epic might be asking for something that is ostensibly reasonable with the elimination of the App Store restriction or maybe even the in-app payment processing restriction. But the practical effect in the real world of human beings operating on these new rules is that you just skip the toll booth entirely. A lot of games are already free to play. And if you're skipping any payment to access the App Store, any payment to in-app payment process, then Apple doesn't get paid for the research and development and for building up the iPhone. And that's clear. And it's good that the judge is at least looking at that second order effect of something like this. Meanwhile, Doran continues, he says Epic would be stopping Apple from conducting a meaningful review of third-party app stores. And even if it did, it would be doing that for free while other stores made money. Bornstein says, this is Epic, that IP licensing is important, sure, after all, Epic has quite a bit of it, but still not a get out of jail free card from antitrust scrutiny. Doran says he's oversimplifying. The scrutiny only kicks in during very specific circumstances. And I think it's important to take a step back here. Intellectual property as a legal regime is designed to give the owners of that intellectual property certain controls over how that property is distributed, including license terms. And if you've got a proprietary technology, that's different from having just mall space or a railroad track or anything else. It is specifically afforded extra benefits under the law. And in general, even in antitrust, pr protecting proprietary technology is going to get a little bit more benefit of the doubt, just to kind of make it a little bit easier to understand, than others. And this can be pages and pages and pages of legal opinion as to how proprietary uh, technology interacts with antitrust law and all that stuff. So Dorn is right to say that Bornstein is oversimplifying. But at the end of the day, Apple is not outside the bounds of antitrust law, but they are permitted to have certain restrictive rights that are put on access to their technology. Apple's business model is pro-competitive, Doran insists, but Bornstein says he's just hearing, we have IP, we can license it however we want, competitive consequences be damned. That's it, full stop. He calls it shocking. I am shocked, your honor. Judge says, uh, Mr. Bornstein, I, I didn't hear him say that. He said, proprietary technology gets you a little bit of extra protection. It's oversimplifying to say that it doesn't. Uh, but thank you for your theatrics there, uh, Mr. Lawyer. Apple does not claim that IP is a global immunization, a vaccine, one might say, from liability, says Doran, but it's still legitimate. And what Epic seeks here is a compulsory license without compensation. Judge jumps in. Courts do not run businesses. In the cases where courts have found antitrust conduct, how have the courts fashioned remedies to deal with the antitrust conduct? Have they in fact said, you billion dollar company, trillion dollar company, you must fundamentally change the business model under which you are operating? The judge asks, well, give me some example of a case requiring a fundamental change to the model of a business. Bornstein of Epic notes the US slash Microsoft antitrust case. Now, first of all, if you've been with us in virtual legality for this 50 video series, you know we've talked about Microsoft and how it's a pretty poor analog to what's happening with Apple versus Epic. It's also worth noting that that case was a government case done by the Department of Justice that sought the breakup of the company that ultimately got appealed and reversed and then settled for a lesser offense without an acknowledgement of the same issues that the Department of Justice was actually bringing against Microsoft. So it has a whole host of complications on a case like this. Doran says that that was a government case. This is the Apple lawyer. And the remedy involved discrete prohibitions on behavior, not mandatory sharing. You couldn't do X, Y, or Z. You couldn't highlight the Internet Explorer in certain ways, et cetera, et cetera. And worth noting now that Microsoft has said that the Internet Explorer will retire, I believe, next year. 
but it didn't mandate things. And ultimately what's going to happen here is that the court, if it sides with Epic, and it's not just kind of an anti-steering rule, is a mandate. You can right now break into your phone and put whatever OS you want on there, do whatever you want with your hardware that you own. But Apple doesn't have to support it. Apple doesn't have to provide updates. Apple doesn't have to acknowledge that it exists. And what Epic would say is that you have to allow sideloading. When we sideload our app store or what have you, then nothing changes in your relationship, Apple, to your customer. You still have to support it. You still have to do all the other things that you do while us in our app store with our in-app payment processing collect money and don't pay you for it. And that's the heart of Epic's case. Bornstein accuses Apple of trying to scare the court by reading out Epic's InfoSec expert Micken's earlier testimony, where he responded to a lot of questions about App Store policies by saying a court could decide them. And they probably are trying to scare the court, but it's probably justified. When we went over that testimony, almost all of his answers are, I don't know, the court could decide it. I don't know, the court could decide it. I don't know, the court could decide it. Now the judge gets to Google. Notes that Epic also sued Google. On Google's platform, there are many stores and yet Epic sued them anyway. So how would opening up iOS actually solve the problem, given that Epic has also sued Google on the exact model that you're saying iOS should use? Judge Rogers notes that Epic may or may not have ulterior motives. We haven't even talked about that. She says it's not particularly relevant to this case, though. Even if she thinks it's clear, Tim Sweeney would have taken a special deal with Apple if one had panned out. But be clear, right? Epic is here because if relief is granted, they go from a multi-billion dollar company to maybe a trillion dollar company. Who knows? But they won't do it out of the kindness of their heart. Epic's lawyer says Sweeney slash Epic have a commitment to helping other developers too. It's not just self-interest, but the judge knows what's going on. Epic knows what's going on. This is one of the reasons why I just don't think Epic needed to cloak itself in this self-righteousness because it is patently obvious that the makers of Fortnite make billions if they don't have to pay 30% to Apple. And it's worthwhile to bring a lawsuit like that on that metric alone. You don't have to be self-righteous and cloak yourself as the defender of the masses. Judge Rogers, coming back to Apple's claim that Epic's remedies would destroy Apple, says that clearly Android functions and is very popular. Doran, Apple's attorney, says Epic would turn iOS into a poor imitation of Android and remove user's choice to get something that works differently. Man, if they lose this case, that's going to come back to haunt them. Android will just run that ad. iOS, Apple said that if they tried to do this and they're mandated by law now to do it, they would be a poor imitation of the product that we have on the market. But still, it's worthwhile to note that effectively what Apple is saying here is that we have a right to sell the product that we want to sell. If you change us into that product, we're going to do it worse. That's not what our business philosophy is. All right, we're going to have closing remarks now. Here we are at the end of the end. Bornstein is back to the idea that Apple clearly has options that would let it feasibly open up iOS, saying Apple's lawyers are just trying to scare the court into thinking nothing can be done. Apple's door encounters says Bornstein is just making stuff up about how Apple could reasonably manage iOS under its proposed remedies, cites Apple's expert witness, Avial Rubin's testimony to talk about security threats that Epic allegedly wouldn't let Apple deal with. These security experts all fought about exactly how much control Apple should have over those third-party app stores. Borenstein describes Apple's argument as, we're doing a really good job, Your Honor. Please let us continue to do a really good job. And we're the benevolent overlord of this ecosystem. But that is not a defense under the antitrust laws. Epic's Bornstein then expresses appreciation for the judge hearing the case. Apple's Doran says that on that point, they both agree And now the judge says, oh, by the way, that August 13th thing that I mentioned in the last video, that was just a joke. August 13th was the day that you put up the hot fix. That was the mega drop day. And so it was just the anniversary. I will want to get this done while the memory of testimony is fresh, but I promise no date. There are thousands of pages of testimony to review. So we might not have to wait for August. It will, in my opinion, be at least a few weeks, if not a month or more. Uh, but we will get an opinion and that opinion will be appealed maybe the same day. Who knows? It'll be appealed very fast by the loser and it might be appealed by both parties if the judge tries to split this baby and winds up splitting it in a fashion that neither side really likes. Finally, I wanted to give Ms. Robertson at The Verge the last say here. She wanted to thank everybody that helped and I wanted to thank them as well. Thank you very much to Addie Robertson. Thank you to The Verge. We've got thank yous to Leah Nyland, Nick Statt, Shannon Liao, Dorakki, which is almost Dothraki, but not quite. Tom Warren, Russell Bramden, and a bunch of other folks. As we said at the top of this series, there was no way I would be able to run my law firm, help my clients do my legal best and not commit malpractice 
while still listening to every minute of this trial on the phone. And I wouldn't be able to do that. So you do get a little game of telephone here. You get somebody speaking. You don't get physical observations of how they're speaking. You then get it gone through Addie Robertson selecting things and then me selecting it and then me commenting on it. So it's not perfect, but I think a lot of you have really enjoyed this series. I really want to thank everybody that's joined me for it. I did promise here at the end that I would talk a little bit about my opinions here. Obviously, I think editorializing, of course, uh, when this trial started that Apple had by far the easier case, Epic had the higher hill to climb. I think Epic made some successful inroads with some of the complaints that they made. Certainly, Epic was able to put a bad face on some of Apple's decisions, make them look arbitrary and capricious in a way that I think a lot of us that follow that company have known that Apple can look like in certain circumstances. And I think they were pretty successful in that. And in an antitrust case, I do think that that's pretty helpful, that when you can cast Apple as potentially uncaring, uh, potentially robotic, and going after other competitors and maybe even competition itself in a manner that doesn't care about public interest or consumer welfare or all these other things, you can have some success. I think the judge rightfully thinks that Epic's theory goes too far. I think they are unlikely to give them a win on the monopoly question, as I've mentioned earlier in this series, if this access is monopolistic, then you've got all sorts of problems with every walled garden on earth. I think that she is likely to deny them that, but who knows? And then I think that she might just want to give Epic a little bit of a win uh, because of what she has seen from Apple and what Epic has been able to prove about how Apple interacts with its developers and say that those anti-steering rules have to be modified, have to go, probably with Apple and Epic sitting at the table for how that looks. I don't know about that. But that's how I see this going. What do you think? Leave a comment to this video about who you think is going to win, what the judge is going to say, on the understanding from both me, the lawyer, and you, in all likelihood not a lawyer, that we're all trying to read one person in California's mind, and that always, always, always is not going to be a perfect process. So again, thank you to everybody who's joined me for this series. If you like this, if you like talking about business and law, video games, technology, and more, please, please, please consider supporting the channel. We've got a Patreon, Streamlabs, and a store to buy things from. I could not do it without you. This has obviously been a ton of work uh, from my end, but I have loved every minute of it, if you can't tell. Otherwise, if you just subscribe, ring the bell, upvotes, downvotes, tell YouTube we're here, tell forums we're here, tell your friends we're here. I would very, very much appreciate it. If you watch this on YouTube, thank you so much for joining me today in Virtual Legality. If you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.